years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello and welcome. I'm James Max. You're with Talk TV. On TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. This is Primetime, bringing you all the stories that matter. On the show tonight, Labour's health secretary takes on his own party with a plan to radically reform the crumbling NHS. He says he's up for the fight with unions uh, and won't bow to middle-class lefties. But tonight we ask, will Wes Streeting's plan actually work? Also tonight, we'll be unpacking the conflicting reports suggesting a ceasefire deal in the Israel-Hamas war could be close. And millions of stargazers, they wait to be plunged into the darkness as the rare solar eclipse begins. We'll be live in Montreal where thousands are gathering to watch the phenomenon. Plus, we'll bring you our nightly panel looking at the other stories making the headlines today with political correspondent at Politics Joe, that's Ava Santina, and Conservative peer Lord Vasey. This is Primetime. Very good evening to you. Our top story tonight, Labour warns there will be no extra funding for the NHS without major surgery or reform. Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting says the organisation will only gain access to Labour's £1 billion in funding if staff agree to work weekends to get the waiting list down. He says he's up for the fight with the unions and won't bow to middle-class lefties. Labour may be talking tough, but who can trust? Uh, who, who can voters trust uh, to get the job done? Is it Keir Starmer planning to use the spare capacity of private healthcare to slash waiting lists, or is it the Conservatives with things like their long-term workforce plan designed to train and retain more staff? Well, joining me for more is Dr. Soleil Hassan and former Labour advisor John McTernan. So, uh, Dr. Soleil, thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, tonight here on Talk TV. So, let's talk about the pressing problems facing the NHS. Of course, there are many things, but what's top of the list? I have to say, James, um, <laughs> I've just got to say it. Uh, my pressing problem today are two people, uh, senior politicians within the Labour Party, rolling up their sleeves and strolling down a hospital corridor as if they've got all the answers. So for me, right, and, and the language that's being used today, fighting, fighting against the unions, um, a, a ridiculous uh, plan to revolutionise revolutionize by making healthcare workers work on the weekend. News for them, we already do. Um, but what are the major problems? I think there's been some really worrying stats that have been com coming out over the last week about the impact of long waits within the emergency department that are costing lives. Some important work done by the Royal College of Emergency Medicine to show the impact on mortality rates caused by long delays. Again, this is not something new. This is not something that we've only just found out. This is something that we've been speaking about or the Royal College of Emergency Medicine has been speaking about, warning out about for an excess of 10 years. We've also got an FOI that was done, I believe, by the Lib Dems today that has revealed that um, people are having to wait within the emergency department for an excess of a day to get to a hospital bed again. This is not news. This isn't something that we've been warning about. This isn't something that we haven't actually physically witnessed and seen ourselves. The emergency department is not a ward. The emergency department is a place you go to when you're sick and have an acute problem that needs attention. A decision is made then and there uh, after assessment whether you can safely go home or whether you need to be admitted. You are then supposed to move on to the next place. You're not supposed to stay in the emergency department. Year on year, um, right through up until COVID and even uh, up until now, people are arriving in, emerg in the emergency department and staying and areas of the emergency department themselves are having to function 
like a ward. That's wrong. Right. Again, that's I, not I do. I do understand that, of course, there are so many issues. Where does one start with this? But more money has been pumped into the NHS. And regardless of whether one likes the Tories or dislikes their record or otherwise, on average, 3% in real terms in new money every year. So it's clearly not just about money. So when, for example, Wes Streeting says there has to be reform, there has to be change, surely he is right. Can you get behind the fact that the only way we're going to get the NHS in a, in a new shape or form to provide for the country, whoever's in charge, is by major reform? And that means reducing waste, using the private sector where we can, uh, getting over the fact that the NHS is not a religion. It's a service that we pay for. And it never was a religion. And it was a service that I joined to work in and not to worship at. Um, but it has been, and I've been within the NHS now, um, both as a student and as a doctor since 2000. And I, an interesting fact that um, I, I, I just wanted to look up, out of curiosity, how many reforms had taken place within the NHS? Let's just say, not from its inception, but just from 2000. And not to bash the Conservatives, um, but let's just have a look at the whole picture. Since at least 2000, since I joined the profession first as a medical student, just between 2000 to 2010, there were at least 23 separate reforms, initiatives, plans, reworks, new contracts, just 23, at least 23. How much do you think that costs? And that's under Labour. The number post 2010 onwards, both through the, um, the, uh, the the coalition and up until now, the number uh, multiplies even more. Each one of those new initiatives, new plans, new big ideas by a politician who knows nothing about health whatsoever, apart from the fact that he just occupies that seat for that period of time, costs money and costs lives. OK, now let me let me bring John McTurnan, former Labour advisor, into that. So you've heard what Dr Soler has to say, which is, in essence, all politicians, um, they don't seem to have good medical knowledge. They don't necessarily take the right decisions. They want to tinker. They play with the NHS as if it's some kind of election winner for them. Why should the public trust Labour to fix the NHS? Well, the first thing is anybody who works in the N NHS who complains about politicians um, having views on how to run the NHS uh, needs to come up with their proposal for independently raising uh, the finance required for the NHS. While the NHS is taxation funded, it will have politicians determining its policies. That's the reality. Um, the reason why Labour should be trusted with the health service is Labour is the creation of the health service. Labour has always, when it's been elected, had to and successfully has done uh, a job of restoring the NHS. Uh, the waiting lists were massive in 1997. They were our priority when I, when I came in uh, with Harriet Harman and, and Tony Blair into government. Uh, and we successfully slashed the waiting lists and actually, uh, through successful reforms, transformed the quality and the funding to the health service. You know, the resources, yes, but reform, yes. Um, and we, we, we got waiting lists down uh, to a very, very low level. And OK. I, 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 understand, I understand the waiting list coming down, but what uh, those reforms, if you like, also did was supply a huge amount of debt for the nation through the PFI contracts, which have, no, yes, no, provided no, a significant amount of resource, but we've got to pay for uh, this somehow. So either, course, either you're going to yeah. saddle debt or alternatively course, you're going to tax course, people more. Sorry, of course, you, of course, if you want to rebuild uh, the NHS stock of buildings, which we did uh, massively, you do, you do have to pay for that for capital. The NHS have been starved of capital uh, for, the, uh, for the period of the Thatcher uh, and major governments, we needed a massive catch up. And yes, we used we used private capital, so we didn't but, make. But you, but the private made. capital that was used, and you say that politicians it's can be trusted. Money, you can say money. you can say that politicians can be trusted with these things, but it's very clear that many politicians don't understand finance, don't understand how it works. Got ourselves very expensively wrapped up in a whole range of these financial no, products. It cost us more we than didn't. it needed to. No, it got, it was a fair price because we got the new hospitals immediately. There wasn't queuing, there wasn't waiting. I, mm. I grew up in Edinburgh. We had a hospital promised us in 1963. It was, the, the site was cleared in 1973. Right, sorry, um, John. I'm just going to yeah, put you on hold for one moment there, John, just because this is the moment. This is live. These are the pictures of that eclipse. This happens once in a generation. This is right now 
in Montana, in the United States of America. This is, sorry, this is in Mexico. This is the absolute moment where the, where the moon is right in front of the sun. You can see around the edge uh, that you have this incredible, um, almost uh, sort of flex size that you can see if you had the close-ups. You could see almost the solar flares coming off the sun. It's a very, very rare moment. Gosh, look at that. What an extraordinary moment. I mean, uh, Ed, uh, Ava, I mean, this is a moment in history. Uh, are you as excited by these astronomical events? I think I'm more excited. OK. It's a corona <laughs> surrounding the moon there. That's called a corona, the technical term. There we go, look at that. Who but I you? think uh, it happens more often than you think, but you just have to travel to see it. I had somebody on my Times radio show today uh, who'd seen three full solar eclipses. In how long? But he'd gone to Iran, he'd gone somewhere else, and he'd gone somewhere else. In the like last, once a decade uh, or something. In like the last 20 years. Yeah, once a decade. Yeah, That's so, I mean, it's quite I mean, your generations are quite short, then, if you're saying it's once in a generation. Well, yeah. Mm. I mean, this rare event, I mean, occurs when the moon passes between the Earth and the sun, temporarily blocking the sun's light, casting the shadow on the Earth. So, daylight skies, momentarily engulfed. So, wherever they are in Mexico, it's gone dark. Uh, and it's going to be travelling up through the US into Canada. Uh, but we're not going to sit here, Ava. Well, good, you know. I think we've had too much excitement for a decade. Glasgow gets a 20% job mm. at well, 8 o'clock tonight. Well, I thought this happened when I was at school. I'm sure we had an eclipse yeah, when Cornwall I was younger. Yeah, Cornwall in 1999. Right, there you go. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> look at that. I mean, you are full of knowledge on this, Ed. Yeah. And you wanted that job on Sky at Night, didn't you? I did. They yes. wouldn't give it to me. They gave it to some bloke called Patrick Moore. Yeah, yeah I think he probably knowed a little, knew a little bit more than you. But, I mean, this is really quite an exciting event. And, and what's so amazing this is, is that, that moment, as and when it's, it's, it's that sort of, like, almost ground zero and then it happens. But then also the, the move in and then the move out again as it begins to just slowly oh, come light again. Oh, good point. This is fascinating television, James, I think, because... Uh, what we've seen in the last decade is the growth of this uh, phenomenon called slow television. Have you heard about this? And they film things like a uh, picture of a wind train journey window. Yes. And you just you go home, you know, like you've had a day like Ava where you've started on breakfast talk TV, you're absolutely knackered, and you turn on slow television. And what we're seeing today is the attempt by James Max to present an entire news show with a picture of an obscured sun and keep commentating on it. Well, it's, it's very relaxing, it, isn't it? But the problem is it does make you feel like you're quite minuscule and quite unimportant. <laughs> so, you know, how is. are we going to segue into anything else now? Well, it's becoming it's all right. quite philosophical. I, I, I will, I will, I will demonstrate how. Oh, my goodness. Look at that, you see. <laughs> is that happening in real time? No. So that is happening live right That's now. Quick. That is the live shot. Isn't Probably. that amazing? And you miss it, boys. Exactly. So it happens when it happens. So that's why we had to segue off into that. We will be speaking to Simon Calder uh, later uh, because he's going to be uh, doing that. And then you can just see, I mean, all the people, they're getting very, very excited as the, the, the light returns. No and, of course, the, the danger with this is that, you know, I mean, you have these sort of like blackout sunglasses that you, you must wear because yeah. any kind of uh, sun to the back of the retina and you burn them out. Well, it'll be like at the end of a club night, won't it, when the lights come back on and you realise you been kissing someone not very attractive. Wow. OK, James, who, who knew, knew we were going to segue into that? Who knew we were going to segue into that? I don't, wow. <laughs> I mean... I was going to... I, I, I mean, no, for, your, I no, for your club night, you know, strangers bar. OK, just we might as well just stick with these pictures a moment, because, I mean, they. it really is one of those moments where I, I, I guess, you know, being in a crowd, I mean, would you do that travel tourism? To yeah, go well, I would now, actually, because I've been quite... Having spent a day talking about this uh, eclipse, I'm quite into the idea. So I'm going to go on... Well, I mean, we missed this one. I'm going to go... I'm going to Google when is the next solar eclipse and then I'm going to go there. But imagine if you travelled all that way and then, you know, there are some places yes. and then the weather's bad. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that would be very Times radio show, one till three on Times radio every day, uh, said he'd been to five but missed two because they were cloudy. Oh, really? Mm. I mean, that's an awful so lot of not, money that you've just spent. It's not a banker, the old uh, no, no, solar no, eclipse. No, 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 it's not. But here in Mexico, it looks as if it is proper, it's happening, and then... Isn't it incredible? So, you know, th these are real-time pictures, and you can see that it is genuinely... It, it, you know, the sun is coming back. What do you mean by 20% Glasgow's going to get? So what? It'll get a little... like a little bite of cheese. You know when you bite right. the end of a cookie? So it'll look like a normal moon? Well, it's a solar way. eclipse, so there'll be a bit of the moon, a little shady okay. dark right, on right. the side of the sun. Well, how fabulous. Or, no, maybe it's the right. other way around, because it's 8 o'clock. 
Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to discuss this some more because, uh, as I mentioned uh, later on in the programme, we will be going live over to Simon Calder uh, to deal with that. Anyway, let's get back to our conversation uh, with Dr Saleh Hassan and also uh, with John McTernan, uh, former Labour advisor. Thank you very much indeed for hanging on there, but I'm afraid when, when the uh, <laughs> lunar eclipse is happening, the lunar yep. eclipse is happening, it's not going to wait for anyone, not even for us and not even for you, John. But you were busy explaining um, why oh, it okay. is that... And, and I think we all get that we've got to do... Uh, uh, investment, but in terms of radical change, do you think that when Wes Streeting says that we've got to accept that reform and, you know, this this very hot potato for Labour certainly using the private sector, is that going to be something that people will buy into from the Labour Party? Yeah, look, obviously, because the you know one of the fundamental parts of the and faces of the health service is uh, the GP practice. GPs are private sector, so the health service has always been built in partnership with the private sector, whether it's GPs, whether it's pharma companies, whether it's the people who produce the medical technology. So there's always been a partnership between the NHS and the private sector. I think people will do whatever it takes, as, and it's the language Wes is using, to cut the waiting lists as they are now. I do think uh, there will need to be more resources for the health service. Um, they has been starved of money, uh, capital particularly, that's why the rack, uh, that bubbly uh, concrete has not been replaced in so many hospitals um, that, that that we will need to go back to have a private finance initiative, a PFI a partnership to bring private capital into the health service to do the restoration we need there. Uh, we, we The health service spending has not kept pace with population, the growth of the population. You know, we're heading for 70 million people living in Britain and it's not kept pace with the aging of the population. Um, and you can see the creeks in the system, uh, it, whether it's in A&E, the long weights in A&E, which are... Uh, as has been discussed already, are dangerous for people's health and are causing uh, are causing people's health to deteriorate and sometimes definitely causing casualties uh, in, in A&E. So we need more investment. We do need reform. And the thing that, that Wes does touch on from time to time and Tony Blair and his institute talks about too, um, we do have an opportunity with using machine learning and AI, particularly in uh, in treatment, but we can, we can have a revolution in productivity. So some of this can be working smarter some of us can be well, whether better, or not we have a good track record of uh, I, I don't know the eight billion that was lost in some kind of computer system that never happened i don't know but dr slayer look do you have confidence that if we receive and it looks as if from the opinion polls that we will but if we receive a new government and a labor government do you think that the nhs will improve that we will get over these waiting lists and these tremendous problems that we seem to have now or is it simply the wrong approach I think I go back to how John began his section by um, suggesting that if doctors want to complain, they need to come up with an alternative. And I wasn't complaining. I was making a point. I was asked to give my views. It was not a complaint and it was an observation. I will not feel comfortable or confident unless I know why uh, people with a background in health and science aren't part of the core central decision making system. Um, I don't understand why we can't follow suit. Why there, there is, um, there are medics, there are doctors, there are healthcare care trained people within the Labour Party. They are not part of the uh, inner decision making group. They are that they're, they're not within the health ministry as as I know uh, of Labour. I I feel right now, after all the changes and jobs and changes I've seen and all the reforms and ideas and great plans. Um, that have happened since 2000, until someone who actually knows what they're talking about is part mm. of the nerve centre of this, I won't feel confident. OK, well, I'm sure there will be plenty more opportunities for us to discuss the health service. It's the story that never goes away. Dr Slayer Hassan and, indeed, uh, NHS doctor and doc, uh, John McTernan, former Labour advisor. Thank you both very much indeed for joining us on Talk. Now, next on Primetime, pressure grows on the UK to suspend arms sales to Israel as the US sets out a new ceasefire proposal in negotiations between Israel and Hamas in Egypt. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching Prime Time with me, James Max. Look at those live pictures coming from Mexico of that lunar eclipse. It is at that moment. It's absolutely astonishing and riveting. However, we're going to move on. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. The government is attempting to deny reports of growing splits over its support for Israel as pressure grows on the UK to suspend arms sales to the country. Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron has taken a noticeably harder line in his recent days uh, than his colleagues with claims that he's irritated fellow Tories. As calls to end the fighting grow, the US has set out a new ceasefire proposal in negotiations between Israel and Hamas in Egypt. Most of the IDF troops in southern Gaza, they've now pulled out of the territory, preparing for what they call the next stage of the war. It comes a week after the killing of seven international aid workers, three of them British, of course, highlighted. Of course, the fighting's toll on innocence. With the majority of the estimated 33,000-plus Palestinian dead thought to be civilians. For more now, I'm joined by former Minister for the Middle East, Alistair Burt. Uh, Alistair, thank you very much indeed for joining us once again here on Primetime. It's much appreciated. Uh, as we look at what's going on now, uh, what are you hearing from your colleagues in terms of um, both the diplomatic moves and the possibilities for a ceasefire? The efforts still continue and the, uh, you know, the, the media coverage is pretty accurate. So we know that a lot of work is going on in Cairo with the Egyptians and the Qataris trying to bring the parties together. But we're more or less still sadly where we were. A lot of effort is being put in, but the stumbling blocks against a, a deal are, are still very large. Hamas holds the key in terms of the release of the hostages. They have no right to hold hostages and they should be released, but they know as a tactical weapon in their conflict with Israel, it is most important. So that is the, the key issue, to do a deal which relates the hostages to a ceasefire and also to the return of uh, those they deem their, their prisoners. And it still remains very difficult to get the trust that you need in a negotiation to make success happen. 
we saw it uh, some time ago. Remember, the majority of hostages that have been released have been released only as a result of negotiation, not as a result of being freed by military action. And that remains the key demand of the families in Israel who want to see the hostage release as the top priority for their government, as well as the prosecution of the efforts against Hamas. Now, let's talk a little bit about Hamas. You, you, you say that they have the key. Do they also have the key because, until this point, they refuse to recognise Israel as a nation-state? Is that an important aspect to this? It is, but, you know, that's getting... They're not going to change, I don't think, a stance on their negotiation position in relation to the existence of Israel in this conflict. That's, that is something that will come afterwards. There is evidence in the past, in 2017, mm. Uh, Hamas uh, claimed that they changed the nature of their constitution to a degree to recognize it was in effect something that would recognize the state of Israel. But clearly there are those within Hamas who do not accept that and want to prosecute the, uh, uh, the sort of attacks that we have seen. And we have heard them say that they would do again. I don't think a, 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 a full uh, deal in relation to the future of uh, Gaza is it is up for discussion in relation to the release of hostages and the immediate sensation of the conflict. But there must be a political horizon beyond that. And remember, Hamas are not the legitimate representatives of all the Palestinian people. It is the Palestinian Authority. And we mustn't consider that Hamas speak for the Palestinian people because they do not. But, of course, uh, Israel will say that because of... Hamas's refusal to recognise Israel as a state and their, their comments that they would do this again and again and again in terms of October the 7th, both the killing and the hostage taking, that makes it very difficult for Israel to back down from their position. So given that um, stalemate, where does the UK stand with its support or should it stand with its support? Well, the UK's position in relation to Hamas is very straightforward and has been for some time. It is designated as a terrorist organisation. As I said earlier, the legitimate representatives of the Palestinian people uh, are the Palestinian Authority who operate through the West Bank. But you, James, and others will know of the, the, the devil in the detail in relation to what is happening there. The West Bank is an occupied area, uh, as designated internationally. Uh, it is much disputed now by... Um, uh, Israeli, a group of Israeli politicians who uh, I don't think want to cede uh, the West Bank back to the Palestinians or create a state there. Um, and all this, uh, you know, has long history. But the United Kingdom's position over a lengthy period of time, and certainly while I was minister, was that uh, we recognise the two-state solution as the most likely answer to ensure justice for the Palestinian people, security for them and security for Israel. Israel is entitled to security. It's entitled not to have a genocidal force uh, on, its, uh, on its boundary. But as um, the Secretary General Guterres at the UN tried to make clear some time ago, every action that takes place in the region has a context. And the context of occupation and the long dispute between the Palestinian people and Israel is an element of this. Although Hamas's actions were unjustifiable and atrocious in themselves on October the 7th. And dealing with that is vital, but it cannot be fully divorced from the wider issues which you have yourself mentioned just now. And the United Kingdom remains determined to see an ultimate resolution to this. But in the immediate context, the immediate issue is stopping the conflict, getting aid in, getting the hostages released. Other negotiations will follow when that point has been reached. Um, in a word, it might be unfair of me to ask yes or no, but in your view, has Israel breached international law? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but we've all seen what we've seen. Israel would appear to have become, have become precious close to it, but Hamas have certainly breached humanitarian law and nobody talks about that. OK, thank you very much indeed for giving us your expertise and insight. Once again, uh, Alistair Burt, uh, former Middle East minister, thank you very much indeed for joining us here. Now, next on Prime Time, we return because millions of people across the North American continent are minutes away from what's being described as the biggest astronomical event of the decade.
Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. So welcome back. Now millions of people across North American continent, well, they are minutes away from what's being described as the biggest astronomical event of the decade, a total solar eclipse. The rare event occurs when the moon passes uh, between the Earth and the sun, temporarily blocking out the sun's light and casting a shadow on the Earth. It means that daylight skies momentarily engulfed in darkness. It goes cold. And in parts of Mexico, uh, across the United States, uh, and up through to Canada. Now, unfortunately, the phenomenon will be less dramatic here in the UK, but a partial eclipse might be visible in some parts of the country. Now, we need to go live to somebody who is experiencing it as we speak. Look at the shades on. He'll join me from anywhere in the world. It's only the sensational travel journalist, Simon Calder. Simon, you are there. Where are you and what's going on? Oh, look, so lovely to uh, talk to you, James. I'm not looking at you for the moment just because I am absolutely astonished, captivated. You come to me minutes after the partial eclipse has begun here. I'm in Parc Jean Drapeau uh, in the island in the St. Lawrence River in beautiful Montreal. Now, it was always the case that Montreal was going to be a kind of bit of an outsider for this because um, normally in April, it's pretty miserable weather. There's still snow on the ground here. But actually, suddenly, it looked as though this was going to be the only 
big city on the entire North American continent, which was going to see the total eclipse through clear skies. So that's why I've come over here. I booked my flight yesterday, flew out last night, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. It's a fantastically well-organized event. Uh, an estimated 200,000 people all converged on this space and having the time of their lives. And I'll see your eclipse of the decade they are calling it the eclipse of the century which actually if you're in montreal it almost certainly is uh, i'm absolutely fascinated that you just decided to book yesterday i mean did you sort of hear about it you looked at the weather forecast and just got on a plane i mean what how many millions of pounds did that cost I, well, I managed to grab the last economy seat, so it actually was about £350 altogether, um, which was um, a pretty good deal. There were actually quite a lot of us, a little Eclipse Club at the back, um, uh, where we'd all done pretty much the same thing. But no, um, James, I've been following total eclipses for the last 29 years. My first one was in 1995 um, in India. Uh, yes, I know you hadn't been born, but the great thing is that um, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to see the greatest, the closest that the universe gets to magic. At the moment, um, I can look up and I can see a disc, uh, the, the moon just nibbling away at the sun. It looks a little bit, if you can imagine it, like the um, Apple logo. And the great thing is that the moon is one four hundredth of the size of the sun. And in about an hour from now, it will completely have uh, uh, taken over. And for 90 precious seconds, we will be in this situation where the air chills, everything falls silent. Suddenly, you are in the middle of the night, but during the day, everything is just astonishingly, well, it, it is an experience that relatively a tiny proportion of humanity have ever seen. And that's why it's so great to be here with, well, in, in the whole city, I reckon a, a good million people are going to be watching it. And there's many people driven up from Toronto, from Ottawa to see it because they know they're going to have a, a great time here. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated by some of these uh, facts because what I also understand is that as and when uh, you receive that total uh, eclipse, as it were, um, birds behave differently, uh, all the night animals come out, they're all confused, uh, and as you say, there's nearly silence, the temperature will change, uh, and, and for 90 seconds. And I'm assuming that, you know, in terms of what people experience, as you say, it's not something that they experience very often, that what's the level of excitement where you are? Oh, look, it's, it's extraordinary because, of course, nobody's ever uh, experienced anything like this. I was talking to a guy, uh, quite an older guy, who said, yep, we had a partial eclipse here in 1972. And uh, so there's huge excitement, particularly, I think, about the number of people who have decided at the very last minute to come to Montreal because they think this is the place to see it. Um, you will know. James, from your many travels, that uh, uh, Canada is a fantastically friendly, welcoming place. And, of course, everything is being really well looked after. If you can imagine chucking out time at the O2 in London. Well, the tubes have been like that, but it's all been really good, uh, good natured, everything well organised and uh, people just so excited to be here. It feels like uh, the greatest festival they've ever had. And, of course, they've staged the Olympics here. Um, so it's, it's a thrilling occasion to be at. And I suppose it's one of those things that uh, if the weather wasn't going to be fine, it would be a bit of a damp squib. It would be uh, one of those situations which is just not that exciting. Having said that, it looks like you've got clear skies. Uh, it's the place to be. And if you can see it, I mean, what an extraordinary thing. But in terms of, you know, how much time and notice people have had, um, not a lot, it would appear. No. Um, OK, so... Uh, what, what the great eclipse guru, Dr. John Mason, does, he looks at the weather prospects for se decades, centuries, uh, for the corresponding date, April the 8th, and he worked out that the place to be was down in Texas, close to the Mexican border, because all the statistics showed that was going to be optimum in terms of clear skies. Um, if, but of course, as Mark Twain said, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. And very sadly, they've got cloud and possibly rain there. Um, the further you went northeast along this path of totality, so across the American Midwest, over Niagara Falls, which was somewhere I was hoping to go, but uh, they've got cloud as well, up towards Canada, the weather was going to get worse. But actually, it seems that it's, it's getting better. Now, having said that, there's a little bit of 
cirrus cloud in the sky, but uh, it's still looking great. And uh, honestly, maybe 12% of the uh, sun was blocked out when we started uh, talking. Now it's about 16, 17%. So exciting. And then, uh, of course, the great moment is going to be happening at, uh, uh, at um, 3.27 local time. That's 8.27 uh, your time when it's going to be peak intensity here. And it's going to be fascinating to see how this huge crowd responds to that. It certainly is. Uh, Simon, we're going to come back to you later. However, I'm going to turn my attention to uh, my panel in the studio, Ava Santina and Lord Vasey. Look, I, I can understand, uh, you know, this is sort of palpable across the US, uh, their, their ability to get excited about things uh, knows no bounds. Uh, I have to say, um, I'm quite excited by it. To see those pictures, it really is an extraordinary thing. I mean, it, you start to have a look at some of the stats here. Uh, four minutes and 28 seconds of, of eclipse excitement. Uh, this is going to be the most viewed ever. Ava, are you sharing the excitement? Would you what? travel halfway across the world to see it? I'm sad for Scotland because apparently it's so overcast that they're not even going to see that 20% that you were talking about earlier. Oh. They're not even going to see a little nibble of the moon. Absolutely nothing for them. Oh, well, then that's a disappointment. So over to the US. Would you do what uh, Simon has done, hop on a plane? I think I would, quid? yes, I, I definitely would. I mean, I was blissfully unaware this solar eclipse was happening. I mean, yes. I only read last week that NASA is going to give the moon its own time zone. So yes. the time this happened... To the moon, we will we will find out shortly when NASA gets its act together, and I can exclusively reveal that the next total solar eclipse is much more convenient. You and I are going, James. It's August the twelfth, twenty twenty six, in northern Spain. We're going to hire a camper van. Right. We're going to drive from London, playing all our favourite tunes like the Beach Boys and the Rolling Stones, because we're that age. Surely just Bonnie Tyler on and the then, feet. And then a well, bit no, of Bonnie that's for Tyler. You. I think I'll, I think I'll go. And Harry we're going to park up. We're going to park <laughs> up. Dua Lipa. We're going to park up on August the 11th and uh, get the old Barbie out and we're going to watch a total solar eclipse in what by then will probably be about 140 degree temperatures in central Spain because of climate change. But leave that aside, it'll be worth it. And, what, and there's the, a uh, lunar eclipse in Western Europe in 2025. What, the the, the, the fallacy and myth of climate change. Uh, so <laughs> the centre line, though, I mean, it is absolutely extraordinary. So this is going to, the centre line is going to be crossing through 15 states here in the US. Um, the eclipse, most viewed ever. An estimated 31.6 million people living across the path. I mean, imagine if, you know, the information, I'm mean, assuming that everybody does know about it, suddenly it goes dark. I'm assuming, you know, some, some, well, some of those... imagine if you were, uh, you know, some yeah. ancient Neolithic tribesmen and this happens. No, but you would the know, birds wouldn't you? drop from the sky. You think this is it? No, you'd be more in tune with the with, with your yeah, surroundings. You'd be absolutely I, I think without without the media coverage or otherwise, I think that people really would be genuinely, some oh, would be terrifying. genuinely concerned about it. Totally. I mean, look at that. That is the most extraordinary shot. It's incredible. It's absolutely amazing. So it's seven years since the last astronomical event. That was in uh, 2017. Uh, and it's um But yeah. just two years, James, just two years we're gonna be in Spain. Doing this, but you know what? You know, if I had known that there wasn't going to be another one of these in the UK until 2090, then I would have paid a bit more attention to it in school because I remember we had sort of a cardboard tube and a piece of paper, and you had to put the cardboard tube behind you, and you could see the sun on the piece of paper. Now, as I'm saying it out loud, <laughs> that actually doesn't make any. Are we sense not getting? Getting, it's like, are why, we not getting? Why did your, your school not give you those blackout glasses? A, that mean are you can we actually not look getting at a solar thing? eclipse until 2090? 2090, apparently. That just in sums the UK. this government up, doesn't it? Well, it does. I mean, you know, who'd, who'd be a part of that shower? Exactly. Yeah. Unbelievable. But this is, you know, this is a monumental... <laughs> but it, but it sort of shows... I, I do wonder, though, when you have an event like this, it kind of opens our eyes up to uh, our incredible world, the things that we can't control, the things that yes. maybe, you know, we spend so much time talking about the things which are happening on our planet because we get wrapped up in it. Yeah. These are the things that, you know, uh, nature... You know, doesn't fail to disappoint when it comes to the most spectacular events, things that we should know more about, and yet we don't. And and also, we seem to have sort of given up on space travel, on um, space race to uh, encourage our sort of nations to get out there, perhaps because it's so expensive and people keep banging on about the climate. But my view is, you know, the, the likes of NASA, we really should be funding more of this research so we understand more and see more. Well, I think this is the point, James. I think this is the point, you know. Although there are great swathes of our planet that are undiscovered, particularly the ocean depths, it is the universe, the ultimate meaning of life, that we need to discover. And NASA it's... is, in theory, going back to the moon, but where is that ambition yeah, but we all to know... land on Mars? You know, I'm too young to remember the moon landings. I was born when we landed on the moon, but too young. Imagine, it, James, if you and I live long enough to see a man step out on Martian soil... Or, and say, one might, I suggest, step... might I suggest a woman? 
Now, yes, let's, quite right. let's turn our attention back to the person who actually knows what he's talking about, Simon Calder. Uh, he is there in Montreal, uh, Simon, so I guess we're probably up to about 18% coverage now. But in terms of uh, the scientific... Yeah, well, look, Ed, Ed Vasey is exactly right about the plan to make... Um, uh, be in northern Spain on the 12th of August uh, 2026. It's also going to be clipping, I think, a little bit of Iceland. But I'll tell you where... Yeah, the Iceland other and Greenland. Simon, yes, are, you um, getting, are, you, also... are you getting in the James Max camper van in August 2026? It's the highlight of my life, I think. <laughs> but the other thing, other place you can be if there isn't room in the camper van is to be um, on the beautiful island of Mallorca in the city of Palma, where you are also going to see it. So that's absolute peak. <sighs> oh, uh, the Vasey the, the the has I've fallen got, apart in his I've research. He, he wants mates. to go in the camper van. Got, Simon, I'm going with you. I'm no, going I've with the expert two, who knows I've where to go. I've got two mates who live in Palma, Mallorca. I'm booking in now. <laughs> I bet you are. Fantastic. Get your flights good and early. And I've just seen, by the way, my first... Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon T-shirt oh. and my first person carrying a colander. So, um, all Simon, very good. If you've got a colander, you can see the partial eclipse um, in, in quite spectacular Simon, fashion. Simon, can I just ask quite seriously, how many people have played Bonnie Tyler since you've been there? Nobody, but apparently it, the length of uh, the that uh, song, Total Eclipse of the Heart, is exactly the same as the length of time at Niagara Falls that people were expecting um, the eclipse to last. I haven't wow. actually that is not verified this scientifically. It is absolutely extraordinary in terms of the pictures that we're seeing from uh, along the route of uh, this eclipse, because as we see it, so we begin to see uh, what people are going to expect. And I suppose the thing is that when you've seen it in one place and then you see where it happens at the next one and you're beginning to recognise what's going to happen and the excitement. I and I guess that as those pictures have gone out and people realise that they can go out, by the end of, of that trip, I'm assuming, Simon, that people are coming out of their homes, their offices, uh, they are all suddenly realising what's going on. They're seeing the pictures, they're hearing it, they're seeing their Twitter feeds and their and their X feeds and all that sort of business. Um, you know, you, you, you don't want to miss this. This oh. is a moment. Oh, it certainly is. And, of course, this is a city of, what, two million people. So it's, uh, you know, if you imagine this happening somewhere like Birmingham or somewhere twice the size of Birmingham, it is really, really exciting. And as you were saying at the start, 32 million people actually live in cities beneath the line of totality. Hopefully, despite the cloud, they've had a bit of excitement and hopefully they will be um, enticed to uh, well, join us all in the camper van setting off for northern Spain in 2026. I personally can't I would wait. love to know what it would be like to watch an eclipse from an aeroplane. Yeah. Could you follow an eclipse ah. in an aeroplane? Oh, Simon yes. knows the answer. Of course answer. Simon knows the answer. Well, Simon? Well, OK, so uh, there's a couple of um, US fighter jets which are actually flying at about 1,500 miles an hour, which is how fast the eclipse is travelling, um, to, to do various scientific things. But actually, talking to the airlines, they don't want to make any promises, but a number of transatlantic flights particularly from London to Toronto to Boston and to uh, New York, could well be flying beneath the path of totality because, of course, of, of different weather patterns and winds and so on. They're not actually going to say, this is the Eclipse Express. But um, <laughs> there will be, I think, some lucky people with great stories to tell and hopefully some fantastic pictures from the flight deck. Amazing. That is absolutely amazing. Uh, Simon, thank you very much indeed uh, for now. Uh, next on Prime Time, we're going to continue our coverage of this eclipse as it continues its passage and path. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Quite yay. right, too. It's that time again. 
to get the violins out. That's right, Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Now, we're going to be returning to uh, the rather exciting events in North America. And we'll be speaking to Simon Calder once again to find out the very latest on the eclipse as we follow its progress. But we've also got to squeeze in a few other stories which are going on in the world around us um, with my panel, uh, Ava Santina and Lord Vasey. So, first, let's talk about an extraordinary culture which is taking place. Britain's new flexible working rules risk turning the country into a couch potato nation, so it says. That's according to critics. New measures introduced over the weekend. They mean that employees can now have the right to ask for flexible working from their first day in a job. Now, many have supported the move. For some, though, it's fueled fears that it could harm productivity. Now, I find this slightly extraordinary because I think that the workplace has changed in the sense that working from home is part of the measure and I wish it had been available 30 years ago when I started work that, you know, you needed a, a washing machine fixed or something happened or whatever and you used to have to take the whole day off as a holiday and now you can take the half an hour off and say, look, this is the time when I got the appointment uh, and then you, or if you're a bit ill, you don't come into the office and give it to everybody, you still work. Yeah. Uh, so I actually think working from home is a good idea but I just think... People who do it five days a week, maybe it's a bit much. Well, I also think it's an issue with children, right? So if you, you know, we've got a really low birth rate at the moment and we're trying to encourage 30 to 35 year olds to have mm. children. And, you know, if this you is can a good do way flexible, of doing it. absolutely, if you can do flexible working and then, you know, I can, I can hear Mr. Leslie oh, Fair government behind Lord me Pompous, getting all come on. <laughs> what is it? What is it? So is it the sandwich shops that you're worried about? Are you worried no, about business? I'm totally are you worried about working you know, from home. How are you? It's going to be. Have I just misnamed you? Yeah. I'm, no. I'm quite surprised you're in favour of Mr. No, no, no. I, I, I like, I like flexibility, but I also think no, no, that working, I was just thinking working from home only works if you have good management. If you have good management yes. that keeps no, the you thing know, that, in contact with teams, you can really. Well, first, make it you know, there are two things here. First of all, technology has changed things, so you can work from home. Ava's point about mums with children, and it is generally mums with children, is a good point. I mean, one of the things that really struck me during COVID was talking to BT of all people who had to completely refigure their call centres because nobody could come into a call centre. And what they, of course, obviously discovered was they suddenly made, whether you think it's a proper job or not, they suddenly yep. made that opportunity that available. Mean? Well, some people say, you know, working in a call centre, it's the kind of... I would never say that, I'm but you know, start this has actually been a huge problem because, actually, what's happened with call centres is, is that they've devolved them all to working from home and, actually, their working rights have been diminished by them. Well, you well, see, this is, this anyway, is, the this point is I'm a making, round that's going to go on The point I'm making is, is you open up a lot of jobs for people who 
Sometimes. Find it very difficult to physically get to an office. Yeah. Let's talk about elbows. They're making their way back onto the dinner table, apparently. Uh, uh, this is youngsters. They believe that manners are no longer relevant, according to a new study. 60% of those aged between 12 and 27, known as Generation Z, I think Z. in America they call it Z. No, I call it Z, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Same as JZ. Anyway, they believe that traditional <laughs> table manners are no longer relevant. <laughs> and more than a third of them have admitted to using their mobile phones at the table. Listen, you don't have to be young to use a mobile phone. Sometimes, if it's getting a bit dull, out comes the phone. No, but this is it, though. The iPod generation. Manners seem to have gone out the window. Well, who made up this rule? Coughing, fluttering who the made lot? up this rule that you can't put your elbow on the table? What is that about? It's some ancient Victorian thing. Not, not to okay. kind of... Ava, Ava, Ava manners important. Shirt. Well, yeah, of course they are. You know, I can't imagine sitting across from someone who was on their phone. I think I would leave. Well, what about let's, someone who had a, let's their stop this on row. The table? Let's stop the row because we must return to the solar eclipse. Let's go back to Montreal. Travel journalist Simon Calder is there. Simon, give us the latest. Well, the latest is we are now just 32 minutes away from totality. So, real excitement. And I tell you what, the moon is now half ex uh, obscuring the sun. And that means that uh, it's got really cold suddenly and people are getting spooked by it. It's really weird. But I think by this time in an hour, when we're watching these partial eclipses just disappear, everybody will have had the moment that they will always remember. It's a life-changing event. It certainly is a life-changing event. It's absolutely brilliant. Simon, thank you very much indeed. Enjoy the eclipse. I'm sure you will. Absolutely extraordinary. History being made, and we'll certainly be making sure that we continue with that coverage. Some of those pictures are absolutely stunning, and you can find all those pictures on at Talk TV and follow it on the YouTube channel. Now, Ava Santina, Lord Vasey, thank you very much oh, indeed you're for you're joining welcome. us this evening, for adapting and pivoting like the pros you are. Now, that's all we've got time for tonight. I'm going to be back on prime time tomorrow evening thank you very much indeed for watching and you can find me at early breakfast yes that's five o'clock tomorrow morning meanwhile next it's the independent republic of mike graham good night Today on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such is the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the Queen.